It's Freedom Files with James Burns on American Freedom Radio. Welcome to the show. Live on this Thursday afternoon, it is July 28th, 2011. James Burns hanging out with you this afternoon, about to be joined by Bob Chapman, his website, theinternationalforecaster.com. A lot of things to go over today with Mr. Chapman. We're going to talk about what happened last week in Norway, this debt ceiling standoff, and a couple other issues as well. Bob, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. It's good to be here again. It's great to have you, as always. And uh, where would you like to start off first, the... uh, what happened last week in Norway, or with what's happening in the Den of Crooks right now? Uh, we can uh, start off with Norway, and uh, uh, we're getting very little information uh, from the government. And I think there's a lot of misinformation out there, too, that I have seen, and uh, I've discounted it because it's coming from sources that I know in the past have been unreliable. And that just confuses the situation. Um, the attorney for the assailant uh, says that he's insane, and uh, we can expect that from his attorney. Uh, you know, maybe he goes spend a few years in the insane asylum, and then I let him out. Uh, that's possible. And uh, so I guess he's trying to find the uh, least uh, difficult punishment. Um, he had help. I, I don't think there's any question. And um, uh, how that all works remains to be seen. Where did he get the weapons? How did he learn how to shoot them so effectively? Uh, where did he get the plans to use a truck bomb where did he get the implements to make the so-called explosives? And his background is, from what I can gather of putting it all together that's available to us, um, he certainly has been, uh, in the past, a right-wing Zionist. And it just so happens that the... People who were attending this labor festival, we'll call it, uh, were very animate about head signs, uh, saying give Palestine their freedom and that sort of thing. And uh, the heinous way in which this was carried out, uh, my experience has been lone shooters in order to make the impression that they want to make for their viewpoints, sane or insane. You know, usually suffices with killing a few people, not a hundred. Whatever the figure was, a lot. Uh, I think the thing was uh, premeditated. And the minute I heard the news on it, which was a, tomorrow will be a week ago, I said it's a CIA MI6 Mossad operation. And uh, <clears throat> previously, uh, the administration, and most people don't know this, but Norway doesn't belong to the European Union. They do everything on their own. And um, uh, they had refused to contribute, I think the figure was $46 million dollars in the first go-around to bail out Greece. And uh, I think the main reason was that the Greek government illegally collateralized, and this is just coming into the open now uh, with the help of Max Kaiser, mind you. Uh, They collateralized the loans with everything everything in Greece. The whole works. All of the temples and islands and airports and seaports and on and on and on. And 
nobody seems to be able to do anything about it. Uh, and uh, the Norwegians didn't like that. I mean, it's a very socialist country, but give them their due, uh, they're standing up for these people and the Palestinians, mind you. And the Palestinians have a right to a homeland. I mean, their own homeland. I agree. I mean, the Zionists in Israel, they bought their homeland with money from Zionists and mostly from England and Europe. And if you reflect back after the Second Great War, and uh, I went, you know, as an observer during that war as a young person, I remember 1948 and that episode of the challenging of the British and blowing up to the King David Hotel with all the British military personnel killing hundreds of people. And the people who started Israel as we know it after the war were all common criminals in Europe. Not all of them, but most of them. Some of them had robbed banks and just dreadful. I, I like to throw that in because we want the facts. We want the truth. So these people have a history of being violent and consorting with people I certainly wouldn't want to know. Uh, so they they were mad at Norway, and uh, there were other items as well. And uh, I think the uh, the Israelis were behind it. And I think in time that will be proven. But it's just disgusting that they go to the trouble of mind-controlling people and then having them go out and kill little kids. That's just awful. I mean, a human being, and the shooter aside, the people who plan this thing, they're monsters. Because this guy didn't plan it. This is, these were planned by pros. These being two incidents. One, the bombing at the building in downtown Oslo, and then the other out in the island. And uh, so that's my take on it. Well, I, I agree with you entirely, Bob. It just doesn't make sense. This one guy was capable of setting off a the bomb in Oslo, the capital city, then uh, trek his way over to the island and kill, well, I think it was 76 people, Bob. Uh, which is, 25 uh, miles away. Yeah. What was he doing? Have, had special wings or something? Yeah. I mean, not only that, I mean, he had to cross a body of water because there's no bridge to this island, Utoya. And he kills 76 people, and they say that he had a, a Mini-14 and a Glock on him, and that Mini-14 wasn't even an automatic. So he had to have a lot of uh, magazines uh, in order to carry this out. And I agree with you. I don't, I don't think it was one person on the island. And, and there's been reports that witnesses say that there was at least another one or uh, more. Well, I wonder how many were Israelis. <laughs> I mean, they, they keep on doing this stuff and getting away with it, just like we catch them spying in the United States and do nothing about it. Put them back on the plane and send them back to Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, and they go off and steal passports in New Zealand so uh, they can use them for people so they can murder people. And if I, if I recall correctly, now I may have the wrong country, but about 25, 30 years ago, maybe longer than that, a waiter was killed I think, in Oslo, and I hit. And I think he was of Middle Eastern origin, and they killed the, the, the Israeli, Israelis that did it. They killed the wrong guy. Somebody might look up that, but it was quite an incident at the time. And they just ignore, ignore everything. They don't look at what anything, anybody says about anything. They go right on doing what they're doing. And they're our friends. Yeah, like Jonathan Pollard. Well, I don't think we need many friends like him. No, we don't. I'm, I'm looking it up for you right now, Bob. Uh, chances are it probably was the Mossad that was responsible for what happened. I think it was in Norway. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, I just, I don't understand why they're allowed to have carte blanche and go around doing what they do, killing people randomly, whether it's justified or not. I mean, we're supposed to have, um, you know, a system of rules and laws where if you do have a criminal out there, you, you go and arrest them. 
you don't just go off and play vigilante and assassinate him, whether whether it was justified or not. Well, I've dealt with these people before, and I know what they're capable of, and uh, they have threatened me before. I don't often talk about Israel Israel or about these things, but uh, I've been there, done that. And so I uh, have had experience in that area. And uh, it's, it's got all the earmarks of they and the CIA and MI6. What I found sad about what's happened over the past couple of decades, you know, because of the Mossad, the IDF, the Israeli government, is their actions make the Israeli people look bad. And I think for the most part, the Israeli people are good, decent people, and they just want to be left. And I all. agree with that. I don't. I don't like Zionism. Zionism that represents the state of Israel. And you know, I have a lot of very close friends who are Jewish, and uh, they don't like what's going on there. In fact, uh, if I had to guess, eighty percent of the people who I know who are Jewish don't like what goes on there, and they don't go there, and they don't want to go there. Uh, continue, please. Well, it's just it's just heartbreaking because I mean you you see what happened to them in World War II, the atrocities they went under by the Nazis, and you know they, they were generally looking for a new home. But what what the, what transpired because of the you know coalition of of these wealthy, powerful people and the UN, the UK, the United States forcing the Palestinians off their land, and it it just once again brought brought them right into the middle of yet another crosshair. And it's just, it's just sad to see how they're being used as pawns, Bob. Well, I think you're right to a great extent. Um, I, I once uh, I asked a member of the Mossad, uh, we were talking about business, and uh, I said, you know, doesn't the state, this is a long time ago, the state of the economy concern you? He says, how can I be concerned about that when I might be dead tomorrow? The Arabs might invade us. Oh, fat chance of that. But that's the mental concept, the cage that they live in. And uh, it's a difficult way to live, that's for sure. You're absolutely right about that. And I I just, I, I don't know, I find it hypocritical that they always whine and complain when they're getting hit by rockets uh, from all these various little terrorist cells. And that's wrong. I agree that's wrong. But at the same time, they don't seem to have a problem pushing people off their land, off their settlements, and sending in tanks and planes and missiles into Palestine. Well, uh, the instances of violence in, 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 the, in the most extraordinary way is replete. I mean, there's been thousands of incidents. So they've got no right to complain about anything. I agree entirely. Bob, what do you think are the chances of Palestine actually getting its statehood coming up very soon? Do you think it's possible, or do you think that uh, basically it's just um, a fool's hope for them? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think they have a shot. Uh, I hope so. I mean, it, it, those people live very difficult lives. And, uh, you know, it's not like a permanent refugee camp. And if you've ever been to a refugee camp, you won't want to go back. And uh, they lived that way for years. And the encroachment by Israel has been uh, very forceful over the years. And they're an expansionist group of people, and they'd like to take over the entire Middle East. And I'll never forget, uh, I have two friends who are now deceased who were associated with the Abwehr. And independently, they both told me the same thing, that in the early 1930s, uh, Adolf Hitler sent a number of SS families to Israel, and they said, of course, we're Jewish, and and on and on and on. And um, they were infiltrated during those years by those people. 
and I don't know, maybe some of them are in high places today in Israel. And maybe that's why the Israelis at the top act the way they do. Yeah, that's one of the Incidentally, that... the two men that told me that were both generals. Wow. And the one was in the uh, uh, the the Vermont, and the other one was in the SS. I spent a lot of time in Europe, and uh, I worked for the government, of course, too. So I I saw and did things other people don't do. Yeah, that's one of the things Bob always wondered: is why why does Israel act this way towards not only the Palestinians but everybody else? And why do they always scream anti-Semitic, you know, whenever, whenever somebody's speaking out against them? I always wondered that as well. But, I mean, that, that, that does, in a scary way, that kind of makes sense. I always thought it might have had something to do with the way, uh, you know, their parents and their grandparents were treated in World War II. But it may be something even darker than that. Well, I once saw an interview recently of a former member of the cabinet in Israel, and when asked about charges of anti-Semitism, they said, well, we use that anti-Semite trick all the time. Uh, this was a video uh, interview, and uh, I saw the woman say it. So there's no question that they do that for a reason. Yeah, it's, it's just a tactic. Uh, Bob Chapman is my guest. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. More of him coming up right after this. You're listening to Freedom Files on American Freedom Radio. Welcome back to the show. You're listening to Freedom Files live on this Thursday afternoon. It is July 28, 2011. James Burns, along with Bob Chavin, his website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Moving into the uh, debt ceiling countdown. Bob, to be honest, I actually thought this little circus was going to be wrapped up weeks ago, but it, it seems like they're letting it go down to the wire for some reason. No, I don't think you're going to hear this anyplace else. But the real reason behind... Uh all the fall morale and the political posturing, and everybody in Congress knows this, and probably in the Beltway for that matter. Whatever they do, you know, right now they're talking about a cut of 1.7 trillion over 10 years. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, it's obvious that neither side wants any cuts. Obvious. But what is lurking underneath the surface? that they're not talking about is the real reason. And that is they want to cut Social Security and Medicare. There's two reasons for that. Number one, so that the supposed lack of funds, which were stolen, in those two pools, which come into the general fund, uh, those extra monies that they would get from cutting back money and services to the old will be used for more wars. I mean, we just spent in the last 10 years five to six trillion dollars. And those figures just came from two universities. And I don't make this stuff up. And, um, The second reason, besides gleaning the money, is they want to get rid of old people. They're retired, they're useless eaters, they're a drain on society because the government's got to pay out money to keep them alive, you know, treat them, so to speak. And uh, as you know, as soon as the Obama uh, medical reform plan comes into being in a few few years, I guess. Uh, they're going to have these boards, and they're going to say, Mr. Chapman, you're now 79, and you've got this. And it's going to cost us, we can keep you alive for the next six or seven years probably. It's going to cost us about a million dollars a year to do that. So we're not going to treat you, we're going to let you die. And that's the way it's going to be. And if you Americans out there think it's going to be any other way, you're morons. 
get smart. This is what this is all about. And if they cut back on the money that goes out to Social Security, we get 10.6% inflation right now. Well, three years of that, and you got half your Social Security check, buying power, wiped out. So when you go to buy that medicine, you say, well, gee, I don't have enough for 10 pills. I only get enough for two. You take the two pills, hey, and you die. Or I can't buy food. Even cat food's too expensive for me. And you go into malnutrition, and then you die. Isn't that terrific? That's what your congressmen and the members of the House and the Senate have done to you. And if you people who are 45 and 55 and 60 think that you're going to live beyond 65, get serious. They don't want any useless eaters. And depending upon who you read in the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberger Group, the Illuminati, depending upon who you read, they all have their own versions of whether the figure is 60 or 90 percent of the people in the world should be liquidated. Prince Philip in England says if I'm going to come back to life again, I want to come back as a disease so I can kill as many people as possible. Does that sound like something that a sane person would say? I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, Prince Philip, uh, Elizabeth's husband, has uh, been known for saying a lot of uh, wonderful things, Bob. And, and, she's and incidentally, just... I've talked to him, uh, I think, three times. So I've met him in person and discussed issues with him. He didn't know that I knew what I knew, but that's okay. I mean, they're going to be a spy here and there anyway. So go ahead. Uh, I mean... Yeah, it, it does seem like that this is just another, you know, another um, nail in the coffin that they're hammering down upon us. I mean, this this whole charade with the whole, like, you know, this side squabbling over this and this. And you're absolutely right. I mean, the cuts aren't, aren't, aren't going to solve the problem. They're going to raise the debt ceiling. They're going to dig the hole deeper. And these, these cuts are ridiculous. They're, they're, they're not solving anything. They're, they're just going to make things worse in the long haul. And, I mean, do you think that they're... They're they're willing to actually go through with a default, or do you think that somehow they're gonna, you know, at the last second come up with a deal, or do you think that perhaps even Obama might pull out an executive order like a couple of other Congress critters have suggested? Well, executive order, no matter what ex President Clinton and others say, is totally unconstitutional. Period. And that's the end of that. And so that's not gonna happen. If it does, it'll be struck down. And it might take several months to do so. But what I think they'll do is they can't get the, what they want. And this is really the underlying factor. Because you know they have no seriousness about cutting anything. And the Republicans, who have the majority, eminently say, no tax increases. So with those things said and in mind, the only place that something can happen is in the cutting of things that they already have in their budget. And that's the two prime factors. That's what they're after. I saw an interview, a senator from Texas, is it Kay Hutchinson? And she says, oh, yeah, we got to cut Social Security and Medicare. Well, that's nice for her to say. She happens to be wealthy. And how a state could, could elect somebody like her is beyond me. But um, that's very common uh, in the uh, in the genre of politics, and so uh, that's what they that's what they're going to do. She let the cat out of the bag. But I've been talking about this for about a week. It finally dawned on me what they were up to, and uh, and anyway, that's the way it's going to go. They, what they'll do if they can't get it now, they get an extension. And the extension will be carried out um, I figured October the fifteenth would do it, but 
But they're talking in terms of December. So who knows? They want time, and the reason they want time is they want to get those two items cut back. Uh, how much they're going to be able to get away with, I don't know. It may be freezing the payout. Uh, who knows what they're going to do. But, well, I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to be in Congress and have voted for that. I don't think that uh, the individuals are uh, reelectable. You know, old people vote. They don't have much else better to do. And uh, that would really get their attention. And those who weren't prone to normally vote, uh, they probably would uh, vote against any incumbent who had voted for the cuts. Yeah, I mean, this, this is just another prime example, Bob, how the American people are finally starting to get fed up with the the BS and the shenanigans from our elected officials. And that kind of goes into the next discussion, is that with Obama's approval rating continuing to go down as well as uh, Congress, they're, they're right behind him. And according to Rasmussen, a uh, 46% poll think that most of Congress is corrupt, and I'm surprised that number's that high in the opinion poll. I mean, I'm sure after this, there's going to be a lot more people in the country saying, hey, you know what, you're right. I think most of the Congress are corrupt. I think they mo most of them are only in it for themselves. And then uh, another poll I came across, this one from ABC News and Washington Post, they say 80% of Americans are angry right now. So, I mean, this, this whole you know, three-ring circus in the den of crooks over uh, the debt ceiling is only ticking off more people. Well, can you imagine the advantage that this is going to give Ron Paul? I don't think these people in Washington thought about that. Uh, maybe they don't even care. But uh, he's making heavy inroads. And if they don't take him on as a Republican candidate, the Re Republicans are going to get crucified along with the Democrats. I mean, there'll be a big sweep. And if he doesn't run as a Republican, he definitely will run as an independent. And that could put him in the White House. And as they say in French... That change to a law, and that means that changes everything. So they're dumber than dumb right now, and I hope they keep on doing their dumb things, so we can get a decent government and get our freedom back. Hey, I mean that's my sentiments exactly, Bob. And they're going to continue doing this, playing this little game, because in, in their twisted little minds, they think that they're actually helping themselves and firing up their base, but at the same time, their base is crumbling right underneath them. And the only two people in Congress right now that is, you know, proposing any real drastic cuts are Senator Rand Paul and his dad, uh, presidential candidate Ron Paul. And you're right. And the rest of them, with minor exception, are all paid off. Yeah, and and people are, I think people are really waking up to that. I mean, that, that Rasmussen poll saying 46% of the people polled believe that most of Congress is corrupt. I mean, that's saying something. I mean, people, I think, are well, finally starting is. to get it. And that makes it all worth you and I getting on radio and doing what we're doing, opening the window for these people and telling them the truth. And we don't have any axe to grind. We don't get paid to do anything. And I spend 40 hours a week doing this. And I ram it to them at every, po every opportunity. And uh, the truth speaks volumes. And we're going to win this battle before I die. And I hate to tell you this, but um, actuarially, I'm supposed to be dead in two years. But anyway, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. And one of the reasons why is I work very hard and it's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bob, hopefully you'll be around for a lot longer. I mean, my grandfather's, uh, well, I think he's pushing, um, let's see, I think he's going to be 86 coming up in October, and he's in great shape and i think he's gonna probably outlive me so hopefully you'll be around for a while but at the same time hopefully we'll be able to make it through uh this uh dark chapter uh much sooner so you can at least be able to uh enjoy it in the final couple of uh decades of your life but I mean, well you, you know this other... dark shadow has been with us for a long long time it has been you're right and, and it's, it's not going to be easy to get over and i think that 
you know, Ron Paul hopefully winning the White House is just the beginning. It's just the beginning of the fight. I mean, it's a victory for us, but we still have a long ways to go. And you brought up another interesting point about the fact that that the American people are just sick and tired of this two-party puppet show. They're sick and tired of the Republicans. They're sick and tired of the Democrats. And I'm starting to see articles, Bob, where you know people are actually talking about the possibility of a third party or an independent candidate. And as you and I both know, Ron Paul has no intention of running for Congress again. He's retiring. So that gives him the opportunity, unlike last time, to go for broke. Well, that's a good way to put it. I mean, so that, I mean, even even if they do screw him over, and I think they're probably going to the GOP establishment, and the mainstream media. I think they're going to. They're probably going to put in one of these, you know, you know, <laughs> the the next pitcher in the bullpen for Team Tyranny. Uh, but, but that's only that's only going to make it worse for them because in the end, that's going to rally even more people behind Ron Paul because there's definitely a group of people out there that say, you know, something I like Ron Paul, but because he's a Republican, I just can't vote for him. But the moment he goes third party or independent. I think that's just going to open the floodgates of support. Well, it's totally suicidal for the Republican Party not to nominate him. And it would give them the opportunity to get off the hook for what they've done. The people in in Washington and uh, particularly in Wall Street and banking. Because what they're doing is not going to work, and they know it. Everything has gone wrong for them. They never expected talk radio and the Internet to screw their feet into the ground. I mean, I'm all over the place. I, I did a, uh, a radio and television this week on Monday in Athens. And I've done them there before. I, I did a magazine interview in Rio de Janeiro uh, Tuesday, yesterday, no, the day before yesterday. And today I did one in Caracas, Venezuela. So... Our ideas, and I'm coupling the people who listen to the program, are sweeping the world. And it's not only me, there's other stalwarts in there as well, but not enough of them. I wish there were thousands, but there isn't. But maybe we will get thousands. We need young people, people in their 30s and 40s, to do what I and you are doing right now. Of course, I don't don't know. (laughs) I agree, Bob. I think the the more people that rally to the cause, the better our chances of winning in the long haul. Bob Chapman is my guest. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Final segment with him coming up right after this. You're listening to Freedom Files on AFR. Welcome back to the show. You're listening to Freedom Files live on this Thursday afternoon. It is July 28th, 2011. James Burns hanging out with Bob Chabon. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. And, Bob, it looks like we have a phone call. Would you be interested in taking some phone calls in this final segment? As I used to say in the movies in the old days, saints preserve us, of course. (laughs) All right, very well. Okay, here we go. All right. Area code 757. What is your name and what question do you have for Mr. Chapman today? How you, how you guys doing? Uh, my name is Curtis. Uh, I'm calling out of Virginia. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, of course, me. yes. We're oh, waiting for okay. your question, and thank you for calling. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, just a couple things is bothering me. The, the one thing is we could do our part as a public and, and get Ron Paul in office. I mean, or vote for Ron Paul. The one thing I haven't heard anyone really addressing is those electronic voter machines. Uh, I remember um, a while back, I seen a um, an HBO series where they talked about how those voting machines can be manipulated to pretty much do what they want, what the programmer tells it to do. So, I mean, we can all push for Ron Paul, but how do we guarantee? that our votes are actually counted. Well, I think you get a wonderful point. And uh, I'm not professionally in a position to answer that, but it's a great question, and I think it's something that I and others like me should pursue so we'll have an antidote for the thievery that goes on. And it does go on, and you are right. And In fact, in Ohio, uh, they just had... uh, proof positive 
that there was manipulation uh, in the voting that caused a change that caused someone who was supposed to win uh, was supposed to lose won. And so you're right. Um, I saw it in many instances, but without legislation to go back to uh, paper ballots, I don't. I don't see how we're going to change that. Right. Can we overcome it? I don't know. Can we change it? I don't know. When we get an election, it's only a year and a half away, and um, unless people push at the state level to do that, I don't think we have time. And so maybe you're right. Maybe it's fruitless. I, I don't right. know. Right. And uh, I uh, am. I, I can still speak for you guys. Hey, go I ahead, said, I'm talk. Oh, okay. I mean, because we we don't. I, I don't trust the government. I don't trust uh, the things they do. I, I see right through some of their false flags and things of that nature. I think the Trump card is even if we did put someone up who was viable, who was going to truly represent the people, they could still cheat us out of the whole process. And I think we need to take that element away so our votes would truly count. Uh, the, the second point that I had was about the, um, the, the shooting in Norway. Uh, I'm a security consultant, and I, I'm a gun enthusiast, uh, military police. I've done all that stuff. I don't think anyone in history has ever killed 70-plus people, uh, a, a sole gunman, with, um, uh, in, in an open space such as, such as a wooded island, 71 deaths within an hour and a half. I don't think anyone in history has ever done that. And if this guy really pulled it off by himself, he needs to be studied. Because from a tactical standpoint, after you start shooting the first few rounds, you have kids scattering, you have people running, you have people ducking and dodging and running away. So for him to get the number of kills that actually occurred, is phenomenal. It's an anomaly. And I, I don't think too many people are talking about that aspect. My, my point is that it had to be, from a logical standpoint, an additional gunman. And, and it had to be an ambush somehow where shooting, shoot, uh, the, the attack came from different angles to get that many people killed in such a short period of time. Uh, I can take my response off the air. Well, uh... Mrs. Security Consultant from Virginia, I agree yes, with you. And, uh, and I think it's a very salient point, and um, I think that's the way it really happened, and I think we're not being told what we should be told by the Norwegian government. Uh, maybe they're afraid that there might be other incidents. Yes, sir. Well, I just, I just felt the need to say that. I've been saying that to different people, and... A lot of people are looking at me cross-eyed. I mean, I, I'm an avid shooter. I go to the range often. I don't know anyone in the profession that could kill, get that many kill shots. I, and I, said, I think they said he only had two weapons. Do you know how many magazines that is? Do you know how many reloads that is? Uh, the, the other thing is they said he was transported to the island by ferry. That means he must have had bags of weapons and ammo carried with him. There's no reports of that either. So either the, the weapons were strategically already located on the island, which shows conspiracy, there, there's no way he could have transported that much of, of ammunition and weapons without it being identified while he was on the ferry. Oh, I so, think you're absolutely right. So the ammunition, the weapons had to already be placed strategically around the island somewhere. Plus, on top of that, they said they found some type of uh, undetonated bomb. When did he have time to place all of those things? Yeah. I think there's a lot of telltale signs of a false flag and additional personnel involved. And he's just a patsy that turned himself in. Well, yeah, I agree with you on whether he turned himself in. He probably knew uh, that uh, he was going to uh, get captured for this. And, and another thing is his stories were down pat. Uh, whether they're believable or not uh, remains to be seen. But all of those things uh, lead up to uh, what you're talking about. And I'm very, very happy that you called in and gave us your ideas as a professional 
Yes, sir. Uh, rather than someone's uh, in the ring swinging wildly, so to speak. And we get a lot of that on radio and, and television as well. And so I thank you very much, and I hope lots of people are listening uh, to this gentleman's ideas and mine as well. Uh, I think uh, we've got a setup, and I thought through the minute the uh, hammer dropped, and uh, and uh, we got to take it for what it is, and hopefully we'll be able to uncover who did it and how it went down. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you You're so welcome. much, Curtis, for calling this afternoon. And, you know, Curtis, he brought up some very good points, Bob, regarding uh, the situation that took place on the island. I mean, for one thing, if it was just one guy running around the mm-hmm. island with an, well, I think it was an M, a Mini 14, a semi auto, and a Glock that they say he had, uh, there was hundreds of people on this island. Why didn't anybody try and stop him, Bob, if it was just one guy? It, it all just certainly doesn't make sense. And, you know, um, I was trained, uh, like the gentleman who was on, uh, in the same manner, uh, with, uh, uh, people who were special forces. And, you know, if you've ever been under stress, uh, whether in combat or rather doing something like this person did, there's a tremendous amount of stress. I mean, you go head to head to people. And uh, no matter how good you are, uh, you're going to miss shots, lots of them, because your adrenaline, adrenaline's pumping 30 miles an hour. And uh, I know, I've been there, I've done that. And it's terrifying, actually, because when it's over, you're shaking like a leaf. And so uh, he pointed out it is impossible for one person to have been there and shot more than 80 people. And I agree with them wholeheartedly. Uh, I've had confidential, confrontational shootouts, and uh, I know, I know what it's like. And you don't want to be there, but you'd be surprised how badly you can shoot when someone's shooting back at you. I mean, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an amateur hunter, and I've, you know, I've killed big game in my time, you know, uh, javelinas and uh, white-tailed deer. And every time I took a big animal down, you know, there was always that adrenaline factor, the fact that you're nervous, you're, you're trying to steady your, your, your shot, you're pacing yourself, you're trying to breathe deeply. So I can imagine that being, uh, you know, just dramatically increased when you're actually going up against people. And in about the final minute we have left, Bob, uh, how can people get the International Forecaster? Uh, the forecast is about business, finance, economic, social, and political issues all over the world. Uh, we publish on Wednesdays and Saturdays. runs around 40 pages each time. We have a hard copy that goes out twice a month for those who are not on the Internet. Everything you need to know each week is in that publication. You can get a free copy by going to the internationalforecaster.com. The International F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R dot com or to www.int F O R E C A S T E R dot com. That's intforecaster dot com. If you'd like to send in a question and we answer every one, or if you want a copy of either, or if you want a copy of our latest report on gold and silver shares, email us at Bob B O B at intforecaster dot com. Bob at I N T F O R E C-A-S-T-E-R dot com or you can call in toll free 877-479-8178 that's 877-479-8178 you can get either copy and for those of you who think you'd like to be a subscriber you can get a free introductory copy and you can get a free one year subscription via the offer that they are offering there and it is dynamite take advantage of it i agree take advantage of it while you still can bob thank you for so much for coming on the show i will talk to you next week sir well thank you and that was a wonderful show thank you for calling in all right thanks carters for calling in and thank you bob i'll talk to you later and be sure and subscribe to the international forecaster the internationalforecaster.com